So again, our topic today, librarians got game and our featured speaker is Karina Gonzalez from the Scataway Public Library. So a little meeting info, uh, the video, as I mentioned, will be available in about a week. Uh, audience members, please stay muted throughout the presentation. But chat will be lively, uh, live and lively, and we do definitely want you to um, participate in chat. Put any of your questions that you have for the panel or the panelists and your name uh, in, uh, not, and the name of the panelists that you'd like to respond when you go to the Q&A. So here's our agenda, running a little bit behind, but we'll catch up. Uh, Karina's going to give us a short presentation, then we're going to hear opening remarks from all of our panelists. Mm -hmm. That's going to be followed by a moderated panel discussion that Karina is going to lead. Then we're going to go to Q&A with you, and then we'll stop with uh, closing comments. So I'd like to also announce that the sponsors of, uh, we, we co-sponsor this event every fall with Beta Phi Mu. This is the Beta Phi Mu speaker series. And again, our other co-sponsors are the New Jersey Center for the Book, RU Libraries, the Sky LIS Department, and the Sky Alumni Association. And with that, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Assistant Professor and LIS uh, Dr. Emil Lawrence, and Dr. Lawrence is the acting faculty sponsor for the New Jersey uh, chapter, uh, the New Jersey Beta Phi Omnicrom chapter. So let me stop sharing right there. And Emil, please uh, say hello. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Connie, for that introduction. Um, and as always, for all of the work that you do to set up and host this wonderful program, very much appreciated. Uh, and Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our fall Beta Phi Mu Omicron chapter speaker series and MI Colloquium. Um, I'd like to also extend a, a hearty thank you to our co-sponsors for this event. You just saw them on the slide. I'll say them again, Beta Phi Mu, the New Jersey Center for the Book, the Sky Alumni Association, the LIS Department, and of course the Rutgers University Libraries. Um, and I would also like to take this opportunity to speak very, very briefly about Beta Phi Mu, which is the International Honor Society for Library and Information Science and Information Technology. Um, it operates with the motto, Alice and Serviendo Consumer, which means consumed in the service of others. Um, the Omicron chapter of Rutgers University was started in 1970, and we operate under that same belief in the high value librarian's place on service. Um, so to be invited to be a member of the Omicron chapter of BPM here at Rutgers, students must have completed at least 50% of total credits for the degree, have a cumulative average uh, of no lower than 3.75, uh, and be recommended by a faculty member. So should you meet those criteria, you may be invited to join the chapter. Okay. And with that, um, I would like now to introduce the current president of the Beta Phi Mu Omicron chapter, Chelsea H. Barrett, business librarian at Seton Hall University. Chelsea. Thank you so much, Emil. Um, so I have the immense honor and pleasure to introduce our host and moderator for this talk, um, Karina Gonzalez. So Karina Gonzalez, pronouns she, her, is a senior adult services librarian with the Piscataway Public Library in New Jersey. Her passions in librarianship include social justice, access, and intellectual freedom. She began her career as an elementary library media specialist. Then she became a high school library media specialist. Then she became an outreach academic librarian before finally finding her home and her footing in public librarianship. So congratulations on finding your home. Um, She's also an accomplished writer, professional web designer, entrepreneur, and consummate gamer from tabletop to console, and she's a Sky graduate. So without further ado, um, please welcome Karina Gonzalez. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That was a wonderful introduction. That was. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And we can get this party started. All right, thank you everyone for your patience and welcome to Libraries Got Game, an introduction to gaming in libraries. So here's gonna be the game rules, if you will, for the presentation. 
I'm actually going to start off with the introduction for the panelists because as I was creating this, I kept realizing strengths in gaming that some of our panelists have, and I wanted to be able to refer to them as we go through. That way you can sort of strategize your questioning now so that you know who to ask what by the end of the presentation. Then we're going to do some definitions of gaming terms, the benefits of gaming, as in why are you here, why are you watching this, and why should you care about gaming, um, resources for further research, and then we go on to the actual panel discussion. Um, like many fields, gaming has a lot of acronyms, so just be ready for that alphabet soup. <laughs> All right, and uh, here are our players. I am Karina Gonzalez. I am a senior adult services librarian with the Public uh, Library of Piscataway, and I am president-elect of the New Jersey Library Association and a graduate of Sky back when it was Skills. Uh, I started hand coding my own games when I was six. I used to code on the back of three to one contact magazines, if anybody remembers those. Um, I love all kinds of games, but my favorites are probably tabletop role playing games, also known as TTRPGs and video games. Amongst our gamer panelists, if you add it all up, we have over 100 years of experience with games. <laughs> Next, we're gonna hear from Errol Logan. Pronouns are he, him. He's a teen and adult services librarian at the Somerset County Library System. He has been gaming for 35 years and also really likes role-playing games. His specialty is LARPing, so keep that in mind. Uh, he, which is also known as live action role-playing. Like I said, there are many acronyms to come. Um, so keep that in mind if you have any questions about that topic. Uh, Errol actually helped me get started in LARPing when we were in a game in 2003. Uh, Errol also runs a nonprofit organization called The Hero's Journey, which fosters youth education and development by running community based after school weekend and special event programming. And hopefully you'll get to learn more about The Hero's Journey a little bit later. Next, we have Hannah. Hannah Lee, pronouns they, them, is a young adult services librarian with the Belmont Public Library in Massachusetts, although they did used to be a New Jersey librarian. Uh, they started with Axis and Allies as an eight-year-old, but discovered RPGs, role-playing games, in grad school. Nowadays, they mainly run MMOs, massively multiplayer online games, virtual D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, and simple pickup games like Masquerade or Tsuro. That last sentence had a lot of words you may not have understood, but don't worry, we will, we will explain everything. Next, we have Karen. Karen Geist, pronouns she, her, is a reference librarian with the Rawway Public Library. She has been gaming around 30 years. She started with MTG, also known with Magic the Gathering, and Pokemon with her kids. Those are both trading card games, by the way. Uh, but now she mostly hosts family board game nights and video games. And a quick message to all of my panelists, if I say anything that you know more about, please interrupt me and share your wisdom. The smartest person in the room is the room. So please chime in. Gaming is always changing. We want our audience to get the latest information. All right, so as promised, we're going to go through some definitions. We're going to talk about RPG, TT, D&D, LARP, MMO. We'll go through them all one by one, so no reason to frantically take notes. So first, we're going to start about RPGs, also known as role-playing games. And RPG is a very large umbrella term. So any game where you assume the character of someone else is a role-playing game. Role as in R-O-L-E, not role as in R-O-L-L. -L. So this can include uh, games you play on a table, video games, or games where you dress up as your character. It can be as simple as Pac-Man where you assume the role of a yellow head gobbling dots and avoiding ghosts, or as complicated as a LARP, which we'll get into later. Um, in this slide, we see three different kinds of RPGs. The dice and the pencil represent a TT RPG or a tabletop role-playing game. Then we have Lara Croft, my personal favorite video game character and the star of the Tomb Raider franchise. And then a LARP group posing in their costumes. Most games, are RPGs, if you think about it. Examples of games that aren't are poker, twister, baseball, things like that. 
So I previously mentioned TTRPG, that stands for Tabletop Role Playing Games. TTRPGs generally include a character sheet, which outlines the ability, strengths, and weaknesses of your character, and dice that decide the fate of your character's decisions. There is usually someone running the game, called a game master or storyteller or handler, that crafts the world your characters will be entering and lays out the challenges your character will encounter. This is my personal favorite type of game, and I'm currently in three of them right now at the same time. I actually played last night. And of course, you can't talk about TTRPGs, tabletop role-playing games, without talking about D&D, or Dungeons and Dragons. D&D was originally designed by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson and published in 1974. It is by far not the only TTRPG, but it was the first commercially available one and is now the most well-known. Many times people will say, do you play D&D? When what they're really asking is, do you play TTRPGs? It's kind of like someone asking if they want a Band-Aid or Kleenex when they actually want a bandage or tissue. It's a, it's a brand name thing. You may have heard some negative associations with D&D, associated with demon worship or witchcraft. It has been targeted by various religious groups in the 80s um, as something to be destroyed. But uh, Dungeons and Dragons, as well as other tabletop role-playing games, are all pretend storytelling games with no adherence for or against any organized religion. In fact, TTRPGs pull their inspiration from many cultures and religions, not just the Judeo-Christian. And there are currently 9.5 million people who play this game right now. You used to have to hide the fact that you played this game because people would think some negative things about you from your values to your social acumen. But, but thanks to shows like Stranger Things and Big Bang Theory, it's become more normalized. Other geek culture norms like comic book superheroes have also become mainstream thanks to Marvel. So many hobbies that were previously rejected are now in high demand. Super Dungeon. Super Dungeons are a play style that is new to me. I've heard of them before, but didn't dig deeper until I was preparing for this presentation. If you really want to talk to somebody about this, you're going to want to talk to Hannah. In a Super Dungeon, instead of having one person running the scenario and the players are working together to achieve the goal, many groups are working together to achieve a goal. So in a standard tabletop role-playing game, you may have four to seven players. In a Super Dungeon, you can have many tables of people working towards the same goal under a time limit. Each group or table has their own goal that must be completed in time for whatever the goal is. The example I was given by Errol actually is if everyone was trying to take down a giant robot, say, and each table is responsible for destroying a limb or maybe, maybe disabling one of its systems. When all tables have reached their goals, the robot will be overcome and you have won the game. I haven't played a super dungeon yet, but I'm super excited to give it a try. LARP LARP. LARP stands for live action role playing. This is when you actually dress up as your character and unfold the story. There are basically two kinds of LARPs, buffer LARPs and parlor LARPs. Buffer LARPs include real combat with padded weapons. Having had four knee surgeries, I tend to avoid those. Uh, parlor LARPs are more about social intrigue and combat is decided using dice, not weapons. Uh, here are pictures of me playing my favorite character, Liliana Bella, who is a vampire. Uh, I had the opportunity to play her on and off for 13 years. So um, if you can organize a LARP at your library, it's a great way to have your program numbers really soar. Uh, they tend to have at least 20 people playing at a time simultaneously. Rena, real quick, are you saying buffer? What were the two kinds? Buffer, B-O-F-F-E-R, as in if you bop somebody on the head, buffer. Got it? All right, yes. moving on. Yes, thank you. All right, console versus PC. Now let's talk about video games. When it comes to video games, you generally have two choices on how to access them. You can play on a console or you can play on a computer. A console is a machine designed specifically for playing video games. Think PlayStation, Switch, Xbox, Sega. They are optimized for video game performance and cost anywhere from three to $500. Uh, some games are only available 
on some consoles. So that's something to keep in mind if you are hoping to play a specific game in your library. Uh, gaming PCs, on the other hand, which I mean any computer with a gaming graphics card and has the operating systems of Microsoft, Apple, or Linux are much more expensive, usually a grand to three grand. But they can do so much more than play games. You can obviously use them for email, but also video and web design, editing, animation, music composition. So the big takeaway here is to understand that not all computers can play all games. Chromebooks can't handle this stuff either. You need to understand the requirements of the game and get a computer that can handle it. Buying a computer to play Minecraft is very different than buying a computer to play Horizon Zero Dawn. If you have questions as to whether or not your computers can handle a certain game, I recommend using Technical City's Can I Run It feature, which will not only tell you if your computer can handle a specific game, but how far your computer needs to be upgraded if it is short of the mark, or if you just need a whole new computer and it's hopeless. <laughs> um, that link is in the resources slide towards the end of the presentation. Okay, now we're going to be moving on to genres. Uh, since we're on the topic of video games, I just want to talk real quick about the genres that exist within them. I do not have time to go through them all, and I know this graphic is difficult to read, but it's not so much about the words, it's about the pictures. I wanted you to know that these myriad game genres exist, and picking the right kind of game genre for your library will have an impact. And just like book genres, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of disagreement as to what people think which kinds of video games are which genres. So just wanted you to see, there's a lot of them. All right, now let's talk about MMOs. Uh, this is uh, was mentioned earlier with Hannah. So MMO stands for Massively Multiplayer Online. So we're still talking about video games. They tend to be MMO RPGs, which are massively multiplayer online role-playing games. When we say massive, we mean it. These games tend to have millions of people playing at the same time. The largest is called World of Warcraft, which has 120 million players. Um, in these games, you create your own character and can play online with your friends, solving quests, conquering dungeons, and leveling up your equipment. This is definitely another one of my favorite kinds of video games to play. Now let's talk about VR or virtual reality. This style of game usually includes a mask or goggles of some kind and handheld controllers, unless there are sensors that can just tell that there's movement with your hands. It allows you to see, hear, and even feel the game around you in an immersive 3D experience. VR games tend to be far more active than other kinds of video games since you have to move your body in order for your character's body to move. Uh, VR is also used in military training, uh, exercise, education. There are a lot of applications for VR beyond gaming. Now let's talk about AR. AR stands for augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality. It's augmenting the reality that already exists. So the elements of the video games are added to the real world, and it's then experienced through a screen. For example, in this game of Pokemon Go, which is the most successful AR game ever, uh, the player can look through their phone. And they're seeing the real world, so you can see the, the blurred out um, black car, and then you can also see the car in the phone. Um, but in their phone, Pikachu is on the sidewalk. And obviously Pikachu isn't there in the real world. So now they have a chance to catch Pikachu. Um, but AR goes far beyond gaming, just like VR goes far beyond gaming, especially in the library world. You can overlay augmented reality onto signs, book covers, um, buildings for campuses. The uses are, are kind of endless. And specifically with the case of Pokemon Go, it's always a good idea to make your library a Pokestop or a gym. Uh, because in the game, it's a requirement for players to go there physically in order to reap the rewards of the game. So it will require players to go to your library. Um, I have a link in the resources from the Video Game Librarian website that walks you through that process of converting your library into a Pokestop or a gym. All right, so now let's get into the academics of this. Why should you care? <laughs> 
According to a study entitled The Role of Gaming During Difficult Life Experiences, games offered players much needed respite from stress, supported them in dealing with their feelings, facilitated social connections, stimulated personal change and growth, and provided a lifeline in times of existential doubt. And gaming doesn't just benefit us during the difficult times. <laughs> um, other studies have shown that gaming can improve manual dexterity, increase your brain's gray matter, teach social skills, learn to problem solve, improve vision, and inspire persistence. And the idea that video game violence results in real life violence is a debunked myth with lots of research to back it up. So in addition to your personal benefits of gaming, here are some ways gaming can benefit your library and your ability to serve your community. Here's a picture from 2016 of me playing Magic the Gathering, a trading card game with my students when I was a high school librarian. And here are some benefits that I found while doing this. One is increased circulation. This can either be from the gaming encouraging people to come to the library, and while they're there, they'll use your services and resources, or maybe you're gonna start actually circulating games and someone can check out Uno or Checkers which can also raise your circulation numbers. Community outreach. Whether you want to call us geeks or nerds, the gaming community is enormous. There are 3.24 billion gamers across the world. That's a little over 40% of the population of the entire planet. And despite the belief that gamers are mostly kids, the average gamer is 35. So yes, this is for adult services too. <laughs> Accessibility. Most gaming is expensive. It's the biggest hobby in the world, and it's not cheap. Providing gaming at your library provides access to people in your community who otherwise wouldn't be able to game and get all the benefits associated from gaming. Special education. Games are an excellent way to connect with your differently abled community. There are games that teach social skills, that improve fine dexterity, that shape critical thinking skills, introduce kids to coding, encourage teamwork. There are even companies that not only specifically make games like these, but offer training to people so they can become certified therapeutic game masters. One such is Game to Grow, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of games of all kinds for therapeutic educational community growth. Uh, there are benefits here that I haven't mentioned, and I'm sure our panelists will give us some more great ideas as well, but we're going to move on. So the benefits that I mentioned do depend on the game. Candy Crush and chess aren't exactly in the same category. Uh, this is a picture of PAX Unplugged, a gaming convention that doesn't include video games at all. This picture is just the tabletop free play section. Over 30,000 people attend PAX every year, including me. I'll be there again this December. Uh, so think about what you need when you're choosing your games. What are your goals? Do you want to increase your program attendance numbers? Then maybe you want to host a LARP, a Super Dungeon, or a popular trading card game like Magic. Are you looking to target adults or children? Your audience will be very different if you host a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament versus Backgammon specifically want gamers of color? Think about hosting a Coyote and Crow tabletop role-playing game set in a First Nations alternate future where colonization never happened. Want to bring families together? Try a family board game night. New Americans? International gaming event. There are so many ways that you can use games to connect with your community. If you come up with a scenario, I could probably help you figure out what games would help you serve that community. As promised, here are the resources that we shall make available later on. And now let's move on to our panelists. So I already introduced them. So now I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll start with Errol. And Errol, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Errol Logan, and uh, I am the teen and adult services librarian in the Somerville branch of the Somerset County Library System. I'm also the uh, executive director of the Heroes Journey, Inc., uh, which uh, Karina already told, 
uh, everybody about. So, um, you know, our, our basic setup, uh, we have been doing library related programming with gaming since about 2008 in Somerville. Uh, when I started there as a library assistant, um, librarianship is a second career for me. Uh, I came to it later on in life. Uh, and, um, you know, I, like I've known Karina since before I was even involved in the library world. So uh, I was lucky, very lucky to get support early on from staff, uh, from leadership. And if you're looking to get um, a gaming program started at your library system, like getting the support of leadership early on in the beginning can be really important. Uh, and one of the ways that you can kind of do that is uh, that the games, uh, I've always said that the games are a book trap. Um, so in other words, you lure them in with Dungeons and Dragons, you lure them in with gaming. And then while you have this captive audience who becomes, you know, invested, you can say, you can say things like, Hey, you like our D and D session, check out this Dungeons and Dragons novel because Dungeons and Dragons has tie in novels. Um, you can also use it to feed into other library programs. So in other words, uh, Hey, you know, folks, if you sign up for summer reading, um, I will give you a healing potion in our Dungeons and Dragons game. I'll give you 50 gold pieces or a magic sword or something like that. You know, you can work out. This is stuff that has happened. Uh, I've been, I've been doing this. I've been doing it for years. They, if they bring in whatever behavior you want to encourage, uh, if, uh, you, you know, bring me your report card you know, you get some A's, you'll get some, you'll get some experience points for your character. You'll get some, you know, so it's like, this is, this is the way, this is a way that when we're talking to leadership, we can kind of uh, show the value of, of this uh, for leadership. Uh, you know, a good, a good uh, gaming program is also a teen advisory board because at the beginning, everybody chats. Uh, hey, everybody, what are you reading today? What could, what could we be doing at the library? You know, what could, that would interest you? How can we, you know, you, you, you take this opportunity to build this relationship with uh, kids and the, and it is a great way, you know, I don't, you're, you're far enough in your, uh, in your uh, educational journey at this point to know that, um, you know, the new adults, the 18 through 35 uh, demographic is an underserved uh, uh, population because, uh, folks graduate high school and we lose them until they have their kids uh, and they bring their own kids in. The kids that attended, I should say, I shouldn't say kids anymore. The folks that attended my gaming programs in 2008 still come into the library now in their 20s and 25, playing on their own, checking in with me, telling me how their lives are going. And like this, this is an opportunity, like gaming is a great opportunity to build in the public library world, to build these long-term patron relationships that get more and more and more and more support. Um, for example, we had, uh, when I was teen librarian at North Plainfield uh, Public, we had some questions, we had some challenges from folks in the community who said, why are they running these kinds of programs, et cetera. And there were 15 kids uh, who volunteered to come out to a, um, a, a borough council meeting and talk to borough councilors about how important they thought, uh, you know, offering these kinds of programs. So, and, and stakeholders love to see young people engaged in the process they love to see young people uh you know expressing themselves and supporting so it can be just a a really um a really great uh way to go uh so yeah i don't want to use up any more time there's a lot of people to talk so we should <laughs> go on thank you so much errol uh can we have now hannah jump in Hi, um, so uh, my name is Hannah Lee, my pronouns are they, them. 
Um, so I am currently in Massachusetts, formerly New Jersey. Um, my big thing is I basically call what I do an MMO, uh, but it's really actually just Dungeons and Dragons online. Um, it just so happens to have over 100 games in eight weeks with over 10 different DMs operating in the same homebrew universe. So that's kind of a, my thing. Uh, we had over 700 pay attendees for this one event. It was national. Um, they're all teenagers, and it ended up being one of my favorite programs, not because it was really successful, but because it was very impactful. Um, the people who made friends online on the Super Dungeon still talk all the time. And it's not just that. Um, one of the things about doing online D&D &D is the fact that you no longer have to worry about your gender presentation. You no longer have to worry about accessibility. I can't get into the building. Are there stairs? How, how far is it to the elevator? You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, so what my super dungeon ended up becoming was a massively gay super dungeon. <laughs> so all the kids were queer. It was beautiful. Everybody was gay. It was just this. It was like the most safe space program I have ever been in. And it was an accident. Um, so I definitely am that person who thinks, yes, uh, one of the services that we provide is games. One of the programs we do is provide games and people look at it and just like, why are you doing games? Like, that's not educational. That's not, you know, it's not as important as books and all these other things, but I consider my focus when it comes to games to be social emotional learning. So if people are asking me, why do you do program gaming programs at the library? I say it's finally making those connections that teens just haven't had the opportunity in the past. So this is why I love gaming. <laughs> um, and I'll go ahead and pass it off to the next person. Thank you so much, Hannah. Very well said. All right, now let's hear from Karen. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? So I'm Karen. I am a reference librarian at the Raleigh Public Library. And this is a new job for me. Basically, I started last May. So when I came on, they weren't doing no in-person programming. One thing I wanted to start doing is try to reach that 18 to 35 population that is uh, not in the library. Our the Robbie library seems to have more so, of course, the families and the kids, but then we have our senior population. So I was trying to get that, that magic population back in the library to see what people were not just books or so much more. So I started a board game night and I used Meetup as my platform <clears throat> and it's been really successful. I have people from Huawei, but also other communities are coming around and they come and they're bringing, you know, we have games that I'm bringing in. A lot of times we have, they're like icebreaker games. We start off with code names or maybe a, a, um, exploding kittens. And then I've noticed some of the more serious gamers will go off on their own and they'll start, they'll start a game of, you know, Settlers of Catan or something. And then some of the less serious gamers will hang out and will play dominoes or I don't know some other things that just you know not really the, the the real serious gamers but they're just they're there they're socializing and what I've noticed is we have ages now we have kids from you know 18 up to now we have seniors coming in that are in their late 80s and everybody's together and everybody's playing and interacting and and no one it's like a it's an even playing ground for everybody and it's fabulous and people are bringing stuff up and now what i've noticed is there's crossover we have people coming to board game night but now they're also i see them in the library more they're they're there for book discussion or they're there for you know a, a music program so we're seeing it definitely cross over it's just getting people having comfortability in the library and i've noticed through the board games that's that's been the way and it's been a fabulous thing. Um, I've been a long time gamer, mostly card games. You know, magic's been my thing, always trying to build that perfect deck. But I play a lot with my family. It's just, it's a nice way to socialize. It's a nice, it's a nice, easy, comfortable, 
there's no there's no stress involved with any, you know, anybody being there. So I highly recommend it. And, you know, we advertise through Facebook, we advertise through, you know, all the social media, but we found meetup was the way that that's how we hit it, most populations. So I'll pass it off, but it's a wonderful thing to be doing. Thank you but so much, Karen. All right, and now I think we are gonna be moving on to our moderated discussion. So Connie, do we have enough questions in the chat or should I start asking the... Uh... Why don't you and your panel uh, have a couple of, take a couple questions yourselves to talk. We are, I am collecting panel or questions in the chat, but we'd love to hear you guys as gaming librarians discuss gaming librarianship uh, with each other and so that we can listen in on that conversation and then we'll go to q a oh that's interesting so we just constantly say to each other how awesome it is <laughs> <laughs> well <clears throat> the questions that i'm starting to see again are a lot of it is how do we get this started in the in the uh, in the library that's something the question that I, you know, I come from more of the media side of the world as well as the information side. And of course, you know, I'm uh, concerned about some of the violence against women that of course has come up in gaming. I don't know if that's a topic that you guys wanna cover. Uh, but again, I think we just like to hear, you know, some of the surprises or some of the challenges or some of the, you know, Errol started to talk about some of the things that was happening in his library. So um, we're just gonna eavesdrop on you guys. All right, how about we start with um, how do you get started? Or how did you get started? Anybody can jump in. For me, I just started, I literally just went on Meetup. We, the library has a Meetup account and I just posted a game night and let's see, looking for any interest. And immediately people started responding. And saying they were interested, so I knew there's, I know there's a game, there's such a gaming population out there. Um, but and, you uh, didn't have any pushback. Did you have to convince any of your no, higher well, ups? I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a standalone library, so I have a lot of freedom. I'm not in a big, a big organization where I previously might have had a little pushback. I literally just went, you know, told my supervisor, "This is what I'm doing," and he's like, "Okay, try it," and that was it. So it was. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing sometimes being in a, in a smaller library because there's a lot of freedom. We were looking for really getting people in the door. And my, own, my biggest challenge has been timing wise, because as you know, the, the, the more serious games take a lot more time than an hour and a half, two hours. So now I've been opening the door up for people to come in early, unmoderated, just kind of hang out in our space. It's a discovery studio space and they can start playing. And then some of the less serious gamers will come in and you know, we could play four or five games, you know, code names in a matter of an hour and a half, if something, if that's all they wanna play. But there's, there's no pressure if you are a serious gamer versus being a non-serious gamer. So, so then how did you pick the first game? Uh, I literally put a lot that I brought in from home and I put them on the table and I said, what do you guys think? So and you people let it, said, oh, let that, one, that one looks good. It was, we, we started with, I think, Exploding Kittens was the first one. Um, and we, we literally had, a, you know, an 80-year-old sitting next to an 18-year-old, and the 18-year-old was reading the, to the 80-year-old some of the cards. So it was a really nice social experience for everybody. And now they, now they know each other, and now you can come in and say, hey, how are you? And so we, we just, I, I literally just flew by the seat of my pants to see what would happen. So what about you, Errol? How did you get started and uh, why'd you pick the game you did? So yeah, uh, I wear my, I wave my nerve flag really high uh, at work. Um, you know, this is like a, a pretty common, you know, <laughs> nerd, uh, nerd shirt for me. Uh, you know, a work shirt for me. And, and luckily I have the, I have the freedom at my job to kind of express myself in that way. So very early on, I had a supervisor who was like, oh, you're doing that. Why don't you, why don't you run a gaming program? So I picked Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, not only I did board, I had my original program had board games. It had video games. Um, and, um, <clears throat> 
and you know somebody was playing card games like the original program was really big um but the 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 role playing game we picked was 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons um those of you who are not familiar these games come every t- 5 or 10 years they rewrite the whole game so they can sell you another set of books um and but also to revise the the systems to be more accessible like like becoming more accessible and more egalitarian is more and more important uh and so dungeons and dragons fifth edition is really easy to learn uh you know it's not intimidating at all uh it's very easy to learn and teach uh so that's why we picked uh 5e uh and uh that's pretty much generally what i go with we we did some other things we did some world of darkness stuff we did some we did other game systems, but we always came back to Dungeons and Dragons just because the current system is just so accessible. So what kind of sort of spatial or physical requirements does someone need at their library to run something like that? Right. So you need for, for Dungeons and Dragons, I would say especially, you need at least some level of of privacy. Like you don't have to be 100% distant, but... Uh, folks who play get excited you know you get that big high roll on the die and everybody cheers and it can be a, it can be a little disruptive so if you don't have a private place you have to just be prepared to you just have to be prepared for your other patrons to just be like hey they they just you just have to understand that it's you know that it's it's dungeons and dragons night so we're gonna be a little loud uh and you know and I, you know, that has its ups and downs, but I feel it reinforces the idea of a library as the community center and not necessarily the silent temple of books. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, but a private place and, and there's certain equipment that you need. You need a set of books, you need some dice. And if you're going to get started, uh, if you're going to get started, you know, that's where you should be spending at least some of your programming money, money, make sure everybody has a set of dice and you need at least one set of books. Um, there's also a couple of, uh, tools that you can use. Um, so I, I actually have a, books. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I actually, that made me think of a question for Hannah. So what surprised you about gaming in the library? Um, well, I always, I'm always that person who walks into a library and I'm like, oh, this is my thing. Um, <laughs> and like, I, I, I'm very upfront about it. I was like, this is what I do. I'm good at it. I, I build little cults um, and they <laughs> attend everything that I do. So like, that's what I do. I build little cults and they always follow up on everything. And I, I just am very honest when I approach that when, with gaming in the library. Um, and then I also throw things at the wall until they stick. So um, I will try anything. I have a puzzle with pride program where it's jigs- competitive jigsaw puzzling for only queer teens. And they come into the library, they sit, they get really obsessed and it's just like the most chill thing ever. Um, so I provide safe space programs with a specific focus. And then I also have general gaming, like the game room. I don't give it any description. I just say it's the game room. People show up, they find random things. I have Nintendo Switch up. I have board games. I have card games. I have Magic the Gathering. I have journal decorating. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they walk in, they find something they like. Um, so I think that's the big thing about gaming is like everybody likes different things. Um, if they like the same thing, they mainly like it because they like the people who like it. (laughs) So that's the big thing is you can try anything you want and it'll be awesome. But really it's when they find that there are other people who like it, that's when things stick. So bounce back to Karen for a second. You had mentioned meetups. Um, What other ways did you market or advertise to get people to join? posted it on, on Facebook, Instagram. I think we tweeted it. Uh, word of mouth seems to be the best thing and meet up. Uh, the typical way is like things advertising in our, our flyer didn't seem as effective as the meetup and the word of mouth. You know, they're getting, they're bringing their friends in now. 
you know, and they're walking through and they, they walk in very shy at first and then they see people that they know and then they're, they're, the comfortability starts. So here's another question and anyone can jump in. How much do you as the librarian have to actually spend time playing the game with the patrons? Or do you not play? For, for me, I'll just speak, speak real quick. Um, depends how many people there are. If there's enough people, they're, they're pretty self-sufficient. If I notice we have a smaller group or there's a couple people that are look a little shyer, then I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna help move things along. I hand write and homebrew all of my D&D games. <laughs> so that's gonna be different. Um, my, my like video game stuff, board game stuff, I'm just like, go do your thing. Um, but I do homebrew. I do play by post D and D that gets 70 players a weekend. Um, it's just on discord. They ask me questions. I respond and I do that a lot of the day. <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by homebrew? I don't think yes. people here um, might understand what that means. So D and D has published material and it's things that people have created that you can just follow along and it's a world that you can just explore with your players. You can guide them through the world that has been published. Homebrew is I made this up and everything I say goes. <laughs> so um, I have a Feywild campaign that who, that's nickname is currently the Fey Club, the Fey Prince Fan Club. Um, it has a lot of connections to literature. Uh, it does very few actual lore connections to traditional Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Errol, was there something you wanted to say earlier? Yeah, yeah. So um, honestly, Karen asked, answered the question for for board games. You absolutely have to be prepared to both run the game and step aside. OK, you have to be ready to teach the game. Like if they just want to play, you have a, you're playing a five person game. There's five of them. Great. You sit out and you just, you know, provide the rules. But you need for Dungeons and Dragons, if you are playing as the dungeon master, you're there the whole time. Uh, Hannah, do you do you they do they let you write games on your work time? Um. Yes, Sorry, I'm not trying our, to get you our, in our super dungeon, our super dungeon yeah. has a 45 page player guide. So yeah. I write that during work. But at the same okay. time, I love doing this so much. I do outside of work, too. Right. So so folks, uh, you are students and I'm I'm, the, I'm never going to tell Hannah that they are doing things the wrong way. I strongly believe just as a professional, if you are working you should be paid. Um, so doing things on your own time, again, I, I admire you, I celebrate you. Uh, please don't burn yourself out because like, you know, that it's just a, it's just the thing that happens. So being able to prepare for these things, um, being able to prepare for these things uh, on work time can be really important. If you're not getting that work time to do that, then like pre the pre-made adventures i exclusively use pre-made mom uh, pre-made adventures i don't even try to sell my boss on you have to give me a ton of work time to prepare for this i have to you know i'm there's i'm one of three librarians in my building uh so we have to be available for desk duty most of the time uh and i'm i need to be concentrating on my job uh on the other parts of my job uh, if they want to pay me to, to, you know, they pay me to game, but I cannot, I can't, it can't, can't in good conscience spend work time on writing. So that's a, that's a thing. <laughs> uh, so and, and, um, go ahead. what's um, a favorite experience you had with a patron that because of the gaming, they, um, you know, had a big change happen to them or well, Errol's already smiling. So do, 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 does anybody have stories like that to share? I mean, I can, I can absolutely <laughs> speak to it. I don't want to do all the talking. I feel like sometimes in conversations, I, I dominate a conversation. Um, so in my group of kids, uh, my first group of kids, because like I said, it's been 15 years. Um, 
I've had parents come to me and say, my son, my child had no friends. Uh, my, you know, they were awkward. We were afraid that they were going to hurt themselves. And, um, and now they have friends, uh, they have a group uh that and that has happened again and again especially if you get an age group like they get into high school and maybe I have some first year students I also have some uh uh seniors or, or upper upper uh class students and they will hang out together and having in high school having friends that are like in that like higher social group and they automatically backed each other up and had stuff like they formed their own clique in high school and I heard about it from other I heard about it from teachers I heard about and that was that was great uh you know especially coming from a weird I was not always six four so a weird little redheaded kid who got rocks thrown at him in 1983 for being a giant nerd like that was really rewarding to hear. You mean can save lives. Yeah. I mean, I've got like that. Yeah. I've definitely got similar stories. A lot of my virtual D and D teams have come to me and said, Hey, I am doing much better with my mental health ever since I joined your game. I can just go off and escape somewhere into a fairyland, and it's just the best. Um, and then I've also got the teens who have given me more specific examples. I don't know if I'm allowed to share them, but um, yeah, it really has, in my opinion, saved a couple lives. I've had, uh, both of you have mostly deal with a lot of teens, but I've actually had seniors, like, you know, like seniors, senior citizens that have come to my game night and they've said they were sitting home with nothing to do. They may, might have lost a spouse and they have no friends around and coming there was their social outlet and they were very appreciative. And now they started doing other things. A couple of them have now are friendly to amongst themselves and now they do other things. So it's been a nice way to have social connections for them. And the, the seniors can, I think when you're reach a certain age, when your friends, um, when people aren't around or family's not around, it's so important, those social connections. So this has really brought them together. So I've, it's been a, I've heard some nice feedback from people. I've had a few students uh, come out to me when I was a high school teacher because you create this safe space for them and you get to know each other and they get to know your humorous side. They get to know, you know, if you are safe. And, uh, and I know, I mean, I, I myself, I, I'm autistic and I went to, to college having no idea. And I was just embraced by the D&D people. <laughs> they were like, come, we shall help you. And I'm still friends with them today. It's the same crew because um, they're, they're just, they're welcoming to the other. That's the best way I can put it. If you are other in any way, the gamers will have a place for you. Yeah. Uh, the, and, uh, and it, it is true because, because you get these, because here's the thing. It is a safe space. It is a safe space. So you get a kid, a, somebody who comes to a LARP or comes to a Dungeons and Dragons program and, you know, this will be a young person and they will say, Hey, can I play a girl? Um, and you say, of course you can play a girl, you can play whatever, you know, you can play whatever you want. And this is, this is a, this is a place for that to happen. And, you know, you know, sometimes that's, you know, they're trying on something new. Great. They're trying on something new. Maybe that's something that's inside that they're, that they want to learn more about. That's great too. And, and that can lead to your, your, you know, that can lead to conversations that can lead to resources, you know, and you can point them at other things like, Hey, if you have questions, here's our section <laughs> on, on that kind of thing. Well, I'm going to hop in here real quick panel. I got emotional a little <laughs> bit there. That was the connection between emotional health, gaming, safe space. Uh, you guys made really beautifully clear. And if that's not enough to get people to put gaming in libraries, I don't know what is. Anyway, so let's go to your questions out there, audience. We've got a few already. I'm going to ask Emil to take himself off of mute. 
and start. Uh, Emil and Errol have been kind of chatting a little bit about this question in the chat, but if you would uh, bring that out and start our Q&A, Emil, that would be great. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, so my question had to do with this idea of, well, initially this idea of sort of like using gaming programs to kind of like guide people to the collection. And I was asking about um, if that could be sort of reversed, right? So what kinds of effective ways there were to use um, the library's collection to like guide new people into gaming. And there were already some uh, awesome uh, examples of this in the chat, but I'll, yeah. I'll put that to all of you. <laughs> the most popular book clubs I've done are D&D &D book clubs where you get the book and everybody reads all the same book. And the people who have actually read the book do better at the D&D &D game than <laughs> the ones that didn't. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, uh, then also the Faye Prince fan club, everybody knows that there's Faye Prince YA literature out there. It's, it's, it's what's, it's popular. It's a thing. Sarah J. Mass has covered that field. Um, so the fact that they get to fan fiction it up, of course, obviously they're going to take advantage of that. Uh, yeah, and that's exactly that. You, and you working with your a good relationship, you know, depending on your, the size of your building, but a good relationship with your circulation staff, with your front desk staff, uh, where you communicate with your front desk staff, you talk to them, and maybe you maybe you work a shift there, and you keep your eye on what folks are checking out. If somebody shows up to your to the, your circulation desk with a pile mm -hmm. of fantasy books. You you know that is a great chance to say hey you know we have a Dungeons and Dragons program we have a gaming program we'd love to see you come out um, that's a it's a great chance to push it and when you're not there hopefully you know if your circ staff is in, feels empowered to say hey you know I see this you know uh, go ahead you know maybe that's something you want to do I have a question so this is actually um... Laurel Monks, Monks actually put a question in the chat earlier about trying learning more about how to make a connection with teens in the club. What if you're not a gamer and you want to bring gaming into the library, uh, but you don't have the skills or the, you know, or maybe even the passion, but you just know it's something you should do. How would you guys do that? Hannah, go ahead. I know nothing about Magic the Gathering. <laughs> I could not tell you what land is supposed to do in that game um but what i have learned is that teens love trying to teach it to me so uh i just i have the tournaments happen i get a volunteer who's a teen who loves the game who's just like i'll be the judge i'll help you figure out the rules and stuff and then if not enough teens to show up to have an active competition the competition is trying to get me to learn the game so <laughs> people well, who I, love their i'm games actually going to ask them. laurel uh to take herself off mute if she's comfortable with that and uh and ask your question you've got some really great questions things we uh, want to know about can you can you hear me we can where are you a librarian oh, cool so i work at the library at chathams okay um i started over the summer i'm actually i know my questions make me sound like i'm a lot older than i am i'm 25 i'm just not skilled in this area um, but the questions I just posted in the chat is like, we have a video game club, but their main focus is D and D. They're not really looking to stray away from that. But I know that there's other teens that have different gaming interests, and like, I just want to know if you guys have like a little elevator pitch or some way to convince like my superiors that we need even more gaming clubs. Like that's kind of a, that's a hard pitch coming from a library assistant. So I just wanted to know if you had any recommendations. Great question. I think the elevator pitch depends on the library yeah. and depends on what are the goals of your mission statement. What are the um, what are the things of importance to your stakeholders and what can you do to make your supervisor's job easier? Because if you come to any higher up with a problem, then you're sort of part of the problem. But if you come with solutions and you say, hey, I noticed this is missing this can solve that especially if money is in any way involved as in the saving of that's right. going to help you 
Yeah, I think I think Karina, I think Karina pretty much knocked it out of the park there. Like, um, and having somebody that knows what they're doing is really important. And that's where again your community relationships are important. Who are if if it's for kids, who are the cool parents? You should hopefully you should know who the cool parents are. Like Karina is a cool mom. <laughs> um, you know, or if you've got a parent who you know all the kids hang out at their house that is a parent you want to befriend uh that is a parent that you want to to build a relationship with so you can say hey i'm doing this you know uh, like the moms all know each other the parents all know each other so talking to the parents is a way to like hey do you know anybody else that might be you know i'm thinking about trying to larp do you know anybody you know do, is there is there somebody that you know and then if you don't have the expertise, like like uh, like Hannah uh, said, find somebody that has the expertise and bring them in. See if you can get them for free. Um, you know, maybe you can get them for free. There are organizations that um, offer these kind of things uh, that that can be brought in and may be thrilled to come out and see you. And you can always throw money at the problem. <laughs> if you have the budget for it, I mean, for our D&D &D group, I have a professional dungeon master and I pay him per head per session, but uh, we have that ability. Do you charge the patrons anything to participate? No. Great. So Joanna Potts has a question. Joanna, you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question? Hi. Uh, thank you all. This has been really interesting so far. Where are you um, a librarian, Joanna? We'll, and Oh, sure. So I'm in Central Jersey in Lawrenceville, and I work with adult learners um, who are building computer skills, typically as my classes. So we have incorporated in our mouse skills classes some, uh, like a, a little bit of gaming, which I hadn't really thought of as, as such until this session, where we have them use uh, jigsaw puzzles and things like that. Um, but kind of inspired by all your recommendations here, I was curious if there are any online games that you might recommend for people who are really trying to build very basic, like mouse keyboarding skills, getting comfortable with that. Um, and generally what we've been using so far is very individualized. You're playing a, um, you know, you're working on a jigsaw puzzle on your computer station by yourself. Um, so I don't know if there's anything where we could build more community around that, because that seems like such an important aspect of what you guys have all been doing. And um, love great to idea, be great question, Karina. What what's mm -hmm. your thoughts? Um, actually, I was gonna say what Hannah said, Minecraft, um, because you can set it up that there are no bad guys, and it can just be about point, click, right click, left click. Mm. Those are the skills you need to play the game. Um, it's not incredibly resource intensive for a computer. And if they actually have the uh, hardware at home, they could play from home so they wouldn't even have to travel. And if you're worried about logins and passwords, um, the, uh, the .io games um, are often just the instant access games on a web browser. You need no installation, no, there's no paywall. You just show up, you play. And it's all click and like, ah, like if they know the game Snake or if they've ever thought about the game Snake, it's Slitherio, so. So I have a question, which I kind of brought up earlier, uh, not quite as fun to think about around gaming, but some of the really serious issues around uh, violent speech, violent rhetoric, bias, all of that that comes out in gaming. Have you seen that in your libraries? And if so, how did you deal with it? Errol? Yeah, okay, so this is a conversation uh, and it's a conversation worth having. Dungeons and Dragons is a game where the players often use violence to solve problems. Um, it's, it's, you know, pretty deeply dug into the, to the genre, but there's one of the things that I do is uh i always try to keep things pg so you know there's no bloody dismemberments or anything like that but also i always try to make i always make sure that they understand 
um, the rules around if you defeat a foe, they can just be defeated and unconscious so that you can choose to spare them. Um, and uh, that Dungeons and Dragons is also a great place to practice communication skills so that you can resolve conflicts by talking. Like characters, characters, like I try, like I try not to have, like there are certain bad guys that are just always going to be bad. Uh, you know, like undead monsters and zombies and whatever, they're just pretty much always going to be bad and should just be <laughs> defeated. But things like, you know, goblins or other sentient beings, maybe they've got a reason, maybe they've, and you can talk them around, you can find out what's going on with so them, they can why they're acting the way they are. Seeking empathy, yeah. getting them to understand yeah. and empathize. Yeah, Karen, and that's uh, a, a, have you ahead, had any of experience with, uh, trying to uh again i guess deal with the either potential violence or again biased speech or or bad behavior no i have not we've gaming that we're basically doing is mm -hmm. pretty um bias free and very welcoming so it's pretty much just a very safe space what i've been dealing with so how do you put it Go ahead. I'm sorry. I haven't gotten into some of the some of the bigger games. I mean, when you're playing Ticket to Ride, that, it's not happening. So. so, Hannah, you said you have a consent form. Tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah. So I make sure I cover the field before I play. I do tween games. I do teen games. I do adult games. I always do this before a game. And then as I get them, I never tell them who said what, but I just say, hey, just so you know. Gore is off the table. If you would like to describe a terrible massacre of sorts with general bleh, just just act it out and say gore, gore. That's all we got. That's all we got. Um, so if people break this code of con this consent form, then I just tell them leave. You broke it. I, I can't fix it for you. <laughs> and and please keep in mind, you do not have to use. Dungeons and Dragons. There are hundreds of different tabletop role playing games. There's No Thank You Evil, which is specifically designed for children. There are role playing games where you don't use numbers or dice, you use words. There are games where you literally are children. You are role playing as children, so you would only do childish things. Um, there's Honey Heist. There, there's a whole world of, of role playing games that are just for children. Yeah, and there's also ga gaming safety. There's gaming safety mechanics. Uh, so, in other words, uh, there can be things like um, an X card, so that everybody has a black has a card with a black X on the back, including me. And if something comes up in the game that they're not cool with, they can just quietly turn the X card around uh, without making a big deal. And you know, either I'll stop and say, "All right, so what was going on?" or I'll just shift the subject away or uh something like that and if they're doing something and it, again you have this conversation some people mentioned a session zero josh mentioned a session zero session zero is you sit down at the beginning and you set expectations uh and you set behavioral expectations so if i have the x card I turn it around when I don't think they're acting appropriately. And also don't be afraid to just say no. Oh, I massacre the villagers. No, you don't. <laughs> like this is this is not this is not that kind of game. You're here to be a hero. If you want to play an evil character, check the books out and play at home. Great answers. Um, I'm still, I guess, a little bit concerned about, you know, uh, maybe you guys can talk about the issues around women gamers and some of the abuse that they take not in your libraries but in uh in society in general do you guys deal with any of that or, or talk to your patrons about the gaming environments they encounter when they're not in your libraries and and how they could potentially diffuse some of that um it happened to me a lot as a gamer um, yeah, as, as a gamer i used to i used to be a um, competitive magic the gathering player and I actually stopped because of how I was constantly treated when so I would be beaten um, or the other way around. If I beat someone who happened to be male, very angry, temper tantrums, they would call the judges over, constantly looking over my shoulder to double check every single move I make. Um, and I and I couldn't 
I couldn't take, I, I wish I could tell you that I was strong and I, you know, fought for it and I, but I, I was like, this is not, this is not worth the It the wasn't heartache. fun anymore, right? No, no, it wasn't. But I think because I had those experiences, I made it abundantly clear that the games mm -hmm. that I run will be welcome spaces and certain you know, language will not be tolerated. Because I, I mean, I'm adult services. I don't deal with kids. So I can be straight and be like, these are the rules. Or I'm going to kick you out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's getting better. Oh, well, good. But okay. it's still not, I'd say, there yet. Yeah, well, excellent. I so I'm. we're about 10 minutes away from wrapping up. So I'm going to actually go to closing comments for our panel and our panelists. So we're going to go... Karen, Hannah, Errol, Karina, and then we're going to uh, wrap up with closing comments from Emil. So Hannah, closing comments, call to action. What would you like to, uh, to have our audience and our future video audience uh, leave with words of wisdom from you? Hannah or Karen, is it me or Karen? Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> okay. Karen. So so, okay. It's you first. I'm sorry. Here I was so organized. I, I was confused I for a second. A call to action. I, I think I'm just always amazed to be in this wonderful community of librarians and just the staff and how much you could learn from each other. Your greatest assets are to you learn from your colleagues and just the community. And that whether it's librarianship or whether it's, you know, gaming or anything, just reach out. And we we're just, it's a, it's a wonderful community. And it's just been a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. So thank you. Hannah? Um, I would just say it's worth it. So uh, not only is it fun for the people you bring it in, but it adds so much value to your own job that I don't think I could ever do anything else. I just love this too much. Convinced me. <laughs> uh, Errol, how about you? Closing comments. What would you like the audience to leave with? So I would encourage folks to be brave. Uh, I would encourage you to be courageous. Um, I try to give forth a certain impression of competence and being well-spoken this is the result of being a gamer. Like when I was 14, I was a skinny kid with a bad stutter, a bad stutter. And I LARP every day as a competent person. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do that long enough, it becomes a habit and it can be a, it can be useful in your life and in your career um so like that kind of thing could like gaming can help you too um i also just want to take a second to uh yeah gaming absolutely builds confidence chelsea i pretend that i'm a cooler person than i really am and then i hope that i hope that that comes across uh as as confidence um <laughs> and after a while it does especially when i first got, a, got started i just also want to take a second because i do in my other life am the executive director of a charity called the hero's journey that karina mentioned and if you are in central jersey uh i put the email address in there drop me feel free to drop me a line we have resources we have we perform background checks on volunteers i find volunteers to come to libraries to run dungeons and dragons programs um we run D, D programs for kids out of libraries so uh if that is a if that's something that you're interested in just drop me a line i'll see what like we have lim like you know the reason this exists is because people hand me five dollars at a time so we have limited resources but we do have resources so please feel free to reach out if 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 you're trying to find that specialist Karina I've been seeing a lot of comments about but how do I start but it's so overwhelming like I said the gaming community tends to be a collection of the othered I have yet to meet a gamer that you approach and say, I don't know how to do this. And their eyes don't light up and say, I'll teach you. <laughs> they get so excited to have somebody else involved. So you don't have to learn all of it. You're not going to be able to 
go back to 1974 and, and, you know, experience it all. Pick one. Pick one thing that sounds cool. You like dragons, there's something for that. You like spaceships, there's something for that. If you like heists or um, trains or whatever, there's something for that. And just learn about it. And I guarantee you there's a website or a meetup or a listserv out there that does it constantly. <laughs> um, and they'll be then they'll be there for you. And and we are here too. I mean, we're up here because gaming matters to us and it changed our lives. And we want to pay it forward and give those benefits to our you know, communities, both professionally and personally. So feel free to ask us. And if you're not sure how to do something, we'll be happy to answer your questions and help you get the solutions you need. Amazing. You guys are so generous. And that's one thing I have noticed with the gaming community that you just brought out is, again, this generosity and this want to involve other people and, and have that much fun. So that was really great. Um, so Emil, uh, take us out with something pithy and, uh, oh, boy. and inspiring. Pithy. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Well, I don't think anything I could say would be any anywhere near as inspiring as what the panelists and and Karina's moderator you all they have, were inspired have talked about tonight. I I feel like I've gotten genuinely emotional like once every maybe like ten minutes. Of Me too. <laughs> in this event. Um, it's really beautiful. I think you've all given us so many resources for thinking about how to approach gaming, how to get started, how to keep these programs going, um, and and so many rich stories, examples about how gaming like, builds confidence and creativity and community. And I feel, I mean, if I were trying to make it pithy and it wouldn't be particularly successful, I don't feel like I could capture all of this in a single sentence. It would be something like, like gaming matters, but also gaming belongs in the library. And that's sort of maybe what I'm, I'm taking away from this tonight. So that was really good. Awesome. Gaming belongs in the library. It does. That's really great. I think you did it. Um, Chelsea, I'm going to put you on the spot as president of Beta FIMU. I think you really picked a great topic and a great speaker. I wanted to thank you. Would you like to say any closing comments? Um, I kind of put this already in the chat, but you guys are amazing and fantastic and I want to game and I'm going to look into specs on how I can get started. Um, and the audience was great. The chat was so lively. I hope you guys read through it because they were singing your praises throughout. So. Yes, they were. Save the chat. Again, to save the chat, go to the three little dots above the chat, hit save and it saves to your, <clears throat> your, your device. Yes, um, I kind of want to do a part two, but... Um, you know, we'll let you go for now. Um, so thank you guys so much, really. So with that, I am going to say also thank you very, very much for all of your time. Panelists, you are great. Karina, thank you so much for your time. And so sorry that the Zoom didn't quite work, but we really pulled it all off. This has, again, uh, been a really wonderful event. And uh, with that, I will bid you all adieu. Uh, I think the panelists all put their contact information in the chat as well. So make sure you grab that. And I look forward to going to all your libraries and uh, doing some gaming. And I'm gonna start gaming. I don't know. I think I'm gonna be, a, I like simulation games. What do you think? Which, what, where should I start? There World you go. Building, Sims? S Sims uh, if you prefer people or civilization? Civilization. Yeah, I would say try try civilization. Probably six is is okay. your gonna be your is gonna be your best experience. Well, if I now go down this rabbit hole and you never see me again, it's your fault. Anyway, with that, I will bid you guys adieu. It has been a, my pleasure to be a host for this, and uh, we'll see you uh, see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. We'll stick bye. around online for a little bit if anybody has questions. If not, we'll. Uh, Students, make sure I look forward to seeing your reflections and panelists. I will uh, see the students have to actually go write about their experience here and post it. So I will share some of their reflections with you as well. Yeah. If those